And I want to take this opportunity at the start to thank Mr. Jedlicka for the invitation to address the Floating Man Festival of Lieberland. It's a great honor to do so, and I hope uh, I'll have some thoughts and insights that you may find useful. I applaud all of you for what you're doing uh, to show the world that liberty is possible in even the smallest and newest of places, that liberty is an imperative for all people, and that the future can be looked upon in an optimistic fashion as long as there are people uh, who believe in it and work to bring it about. Unfortunately, in the uh, short time I've had to look at the Liberland draft constitution, I have not been able to uh, analyze it very carefully, but I do want to say at the outset of this talk that uh, I was very impressed by the strong emphasis on protections of the individual, uh, his rights to property and to life and to peace and to uh, voluntary commercial activity. Uh, you're on the right trail and uh, I applaud you for the great work on this uh, draft version of a future Liberland constitution. Constitutions, whether they are of the written kind or unwritten, are very important in establishing and preserving liberty. Uh, but there is one thing that's even more important, and that is the ideas of the people those constitutions are intended to govern. Ultimately, it's what goes on up here in people's minds that determine not only the quality and character of a constitution, but whether or not it is uh, properly enforced, whether the spirit and the letter of that document uh, is in fact what governs the land. And you can have the finest constitution in the world with the greatest uh, protections that anybody can devise uh, for um, ensuring uh, the individual and his rights to life and property. But it will fall by the wayside if the people lose an interest in it or become hostile to it become indifferent uh, to it because they no longer understand or believe in the principles that it embodies. So it's a constant battle, even with the best of constitutions, to make sure that people understand why it's there, what's in it, why it's important, and why individual liberty uh, cannot happen without um, a, a firm constitution that people believe in and will uh, actually act to practice and to carry out. I think Liberland has a great opportunity, uh, once its constitution is completed, uh, to become a beacon for liberty. And I would urge you to think of yourselves that way. A beacon for liberty, spreading a message of liberty uh, beyond the borders of Liberland itself. Uh, you might even think of creating a uh, radio-free Liberland. Uh, of course, Liberland is by definition already liberated, but the rest of the continent needs a lot of work. Uh, if you were to create the best educational platform for the ideas of liberty anywhere in uh, Europe or even beyond, whether that platform is uh, in print or radio or television, the internet, or preferably a combination of all of those things, uh, that would be fantastic, and it would cement uh, Liberland's reputation early as people are uh, learning of it and wondering what to think of it. In five or ten years, if a young person uh, in Europe or elsewhere were to ask, where can I learn more about these interesting ideas of liberty? Uh, the obvious answer should be, could be, Liberland. Uh, whether it be Liberland's website, Liberland's podcasts, Liberland's li Library of Liberty, or, or whatever it may be, um, if you were to be thought of as such a powerful beacon for liberty, that that's where you go uh, to learn more about the principles uh, of Liberland uh, that apply everywhere, and then I think that's a laudable objective and goal and entirely doable. Uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said uh, something important about uh, the nature of uh, the government he helped to create. When he was leaving the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia in 1789, it had just come up with a draft constitution, and 
you may know this story, it's widely told, but apparently a woman approached him and said, Mr. Franklin, what form of government have you given us? And his famous reply was, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. If you can keep it. I'm pretty sure that what Franklin meant by that was something like this. I think he was saying, you know, we've written down some marvelous ideas, some of the best that anybody in the world has ever come up with. We've crafted a document that we hope will uh, support those ideas and restrain uh, concentrated power so that people can enjoy the liberties that the Constitution talks about. But uh, in the long run, it's just a piece of paper. And if the American people in some future generation decides that, um, ah, this is uh, uh, ancient stuff, uh, this is from an agrarian society, 200 years ago, that no longer applies, or we have more important things uh, on our plate today. If they decide for any reason that the Constitution is a dead letter, that it's not worth paying much attention to, well, Franklin was saying, you'll lose all the liberties that the Constitution guarantees. It requires generation after generation of enlightened people who respect the rights of other people, who understand the importance of having a constitution in the first place, and who recognize that concentrated power wielded by one or a few men uh, is ghastly criminal business, and we must take uh, heroic measures to prevent it. If people don't uh, believe in that anymore, well, then they'll find ways to get around their constitution. They'll effectively vote it out of existence. So Franklin was saying, you know, here it is. Uh, now let's see if you can adhere to it and, and uh, make it live, make it last. Um, I think Liberland has an opportunity to make itself, uh, just to pick a particular society I have an interest in out of the thin air, uh, you have a chance to make Liberland uh, the Ragusa of the 21st century. Ragusa was a fascinating republic that began in 1358. It lasted 450 years, exactly 450, until in 1808 it was uh, taken over by uh, Napoleon, the tyrant that he was. Uh, he simply invaded and snuffed it out. Uh, but for 450 years, it was one of the freest enclaves in not only Europe, but in the world as a whole. Uh, they had uh, term limits, for instance, that were extremely strict. The top person in uh, Ragusa, which uh, today would be Dubrovnik, Croatia, and a strip along the Adriatic coast, uh, the top person uh, in the Ragusan government was called the rector. And his term limit was one month. And by law, he could not serve again in that position for at least two years. The Ragusans understood the uh, critical danger of concentrated power. And, uh, you know, whether you agree that one month is enough or not for somebody to do the job, that's what they did. And it lasted for 450 years. They had a degree of commercial freedom that I think the Liberland Constitution uh, certainly supports. Uh, that made them a great trading uh, nation throughout the Mediterranean region. Their uh, commercial fleet was larger than that of Venice, which was a considerably larger and more powerful uh, republic um, uh, to the west on the Italian peninsula. So it was a remarkable place uh, to navigate the rocky uh, shoals of uh, hostile foreign powers in the region for 450 years and kept its freedom. Now, I can think of um, a number of places in the history of the world where constitutions were established with great fanfare and enthusiasm and uh, great wisdom, uh, but in time were sort of tossed into the dustbin. And usually that didn't happen all of a sudden, as it did in Ragusa in 1808 when Napoleon invaded. It happened slowly uh, as people, uh, one generation to the next, sort of forgot the principles that created their constitution in the first place. And a very good example that I'd like to cite is that of the ancient Roman Republic. You know, Roman history is uh, a fascinating 1,000 years, roughly. 
at least in the West. The Eastern Roman Empire lasted another thousand years, but the Western Roman Empire uh, lasted from uh, uh, or, or Western uh, Roman Republic followed by the empire lasted a thousand years. And it was neatly divided almost smack in the middle by the birth of Christ. For the first 500 years, ancient Rome was a republic. It lost that republic and its corresponding liberties uh, around the time of Christ or just before and uh, became uh, an imperial autocracy with a series of emperors, some of them quite uh, uh, crazy and certainly very tyrannical. It was a very different place in the last 500 years of the Roman Empire than it was in the first 500 years during the Roman Republic. Romans in 508 BC overthrew uh, the tyranny of their kings. The seventh of their kings is the one they targeted and they got rid of him. And they said in unison, virtually, that, hey, we're tired of one man rule. We're going to do something different. We don't want concentrated power again. It's too dangerous. You can't trust anybody with it. Uh, and so they said, uh, we're going to disperse power. The top position in Rome will be held not by one person, but by two. They were called consuls. They were term limited. Consuls could only serve one year. And during that time, the decisions of one could be vetoed by the decisions of the other. So they had to come to an agreement. That was an attempt to further restrain uh, the concentration of power. But on top of that, Romans established a Senate. It was made up of people whose uh, families went back to uh, the early uh, founding of Rome as a city a couple hundred years before. And they also created popularly elected assemblies with a series of uh, important positions uh, called the cursus honorum. And people could ultimately become a consul, perhaps, if they were elected to one or more of these positions along the way. People wanted to know, you know, are you qualified? Have you served us before, uh, before we trust you with the very top position? Uh, this was also a time of the invention of such things important to republics today, of habeas corpus, of uh, the rule of law in, by way of various institutions put in place, um, the executive veto, uh, free elections. Now, not for everybody. Rome had slavery, especially of conquered peoples. It was never a libertarian republic, but it took freedom to a greater height than anybody had ever known before. And if you were one of those many free citizens of Rome, you had the power to vote in elections and to run for office, uh, including ultimately the very top position of consul. And it was also a time of uh, separation of powers, of checks and balances, various um, instruments that America's founders borrowed from uh, all those many centuries later. Our founders in America fully understood uh, the elements of the Roman Republic that made it free, and they also understood that all of it was lost. They never thought that uh, a republic could be made permanent in spite of what uh, the ideas of its own people might be. The founding fathers, uh, as Ben Franklin suggested, really knew that you could put good institutions in place. You could put words on paper. Uh, you could uh, introduce individual liberty with lots of fanfare and enthusiasm. But ultimately, if you don't educate for it, if you don't stand by it, if future generations uh, let it slip through their fingers, then the best constitution in the world is not going to save you. Um, that's why I hope that uh, in Liberland, what you'll find uh, over time is a, uh, a number of important people who will devote, them devote themselves to a civil society of educated people who will constantly talk about and educate and stress in their conversations with each other the importance of the principles that brought the place into being and what happens if you lose them. I think you're viewing this video on August 13. I'm recording it on August 12, 2020. 22. Uh, that's an important date in history that, uh, of um, an event that goes back to 1952. 
Uh, and I want to mention it briefly. I just wrote about it at fee.org, so you can see it there uh, in the article section. But it was during the night of August 12 and the morning of August 13, 1952, when something awful happened in a place where many awful things had happened for decades, and that was the Soviet Union. That night is known in history as the Night of the Murdered Poets. The reason is that Stalin, Joseph Stalin, the dictator of the Soviet Union, uh, went after a group of intellectuals, Jewish intellectuals, who had been uh, involved in uh, the literary world. They were mostly poets or journalists of some kind or another. And uh, they had also uh, worked against the Nazis during the uh, Second World War. When Hitler's tanks were headed towards Moscow, uh, these Jewish leaders formed the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. And its purpose was to rally support uh, for the Soviet war effort. So they were on the same side in the most recent Second World War when Stalin decided to go after them in 1952. Why did he do that? Well, he did it because he decided that uh, they were too busy setting up uh, what could become someday an alternative society. They, after the war, they were busy rebuilding Jewish communities. And to Stalin, uh, uh, that, uh, that was, you know, that's potential danger. Uh, uh, absolute power does not like even a whiff of competition. And because he had the power, he just decided arbitrarily to uh, go after them. And in 1948-49, he had a group of them arrested, about 15. Some of them, some others uh, were actually killed early. But they were kept in prison for two or three years, uh, cons regularly tortured to try to get confessions out of them. And then finally, in May and June of 1952, they were put on a show trial that lasted for six weeks. And as we now know from archives and, and uh, testimony, uh, the, the trial was anything but. It was just a show for uh, absolute one-man dictatorship, absolute power concentrated in Joseph Stalin's hands. Uh, they were all found guilty and sentenced to, um, in the case of uh, 14 of the 15, sentenced to be executed. Thirteen of them were during that night of August 12 and the morning of August 13. Uh, the only reason the other two were not immediately uh, executed was that one of them, a noted biochemist, was deemed too valuable to the state, so they kept her alive uh, and uh, in prison. Uh, and then uh, another actually collapsed, um, uh, probably overwhelmed by uh, the death sentence and fell into a coma and died in prison somewhat later. Uh, but the other 13 were killed in the basement of Lubyanka prison uh, late uh, in the evening of August 12 and into the morning of August 13. Night of the Murdered Poets. Uh, now you might say, well, what's so significant about that? Didn't Stalin uh, do a lot of those kinds of things? Of course, he was one of the top mass murderers in all of history. And uh, just a sprinkling of his crimes include things like the Holodomor, the uh, man-made famine he imposed upon uh, the Ukraine that killed more than 6 million Ukrainians in the early 1930s. He was responsible for the Great Purge that uh, killed many uh, Russians, many government officials, as a matter of fact, uh, in 1937. Uh, he forcibly deported many uh, nationalities from Eastern Europe to uh, 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 Asia and uh, some of the Soviet republics uh, in that direction. Uh, and um, of course, he ordered executions right and left. The Night of the Murdered Poets, is, uh, I, I draw that um, to your attention partly because this is the 70th anniversary of it, but also because it is what can happen when all the institutions of a free society are missing, when you don't have uh, a constitution that people believe in and insist be followed. Keep in mind, the Soviet Union did have a constitution. North Korea has one. Under uh, the Khmer Rouge communists uh, of uh, Pol Pot, now they had a constitution. I reviewed both the North Korean and uh, Khmer Rouge constitutions at fee.org if you ever want to uh, uh, type those 
keywords into the search engine uh, and, and read them. So they had constitutions, and parts of them actually sound promising. Uh, you know, they talk about liberty, but of course there was never any intention of allowing uh, any degree of liberty in any of those places, and that's true, of course, of the Soviet Union as well. So uh, I, uh, I cite that just as yet another uh, example of what happens when these institutions of liberty are not in place, and more importantly, when the ideas of liberty are not uh, widely uh, supported. It really takes a people of character uh, to uh, rise above their circumstances, uh, speak truth to power, take risks, whatever they may take, and defend liberty even if it means their own death. And that's been the case for so many people in history. It takes personal character. If you know, In the absence of character, uh, you get chaos. In the absence of character, uh, people are not humble. They think they can run other people's lives. They think they know more than they do. In the absence of character, they're dishonest. They lie. They don't value truth as an end in itself. Um, and so that allows for all kinds of heinous uh, offenses against other people because tr if truth doesn't matter, what does? Probably your continuance in power or your uh, living well at the expense of others. In the absence of character, people don't live responsible lives. They're always blaming other people for their own mistakes and demanding bailouts and subsidies that, uh, by robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, they are not um, a courageous people sometimes. Uh, without character, often people don't have the courage to stand for things they know to be right. Uh, and they often don't have a grateful spirit. I think gratitude is one of those important character traits uh, to any society that wants to be free. Because gratitude, or a grateful spirit, thankfulness, is a recognition that not all the good things that have happened to you uh, are of your own doing. Often, uh, good things that happen to you are because of the works, the contributions, the inventions, the innovations of other people. Uh, have you ever noticed how people on the left who are so virulently anti-private property and anti-entrepreneurs, they, they never take any time to say to an entrepreneur, uh, to a business owner, hey, thank you for taking risks and hiring people and inventing things and innovating and and uh, producing products that people like and will buy repeatedly. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and, with, and doing it without some master commander at the, at the top ordering you to do it uh, uh, at gunpoint. Uh, but people, I think, who believe in liberty should cultivate a, a grateful spirit. We should be thankful uh, for the wonderful things that happen around us when people are free, free to produce, free to create, free to enjoy the fulfillment of being an entrepreneur, uh, of helping others, uh, and doing so uh, from the heart, not uh, because government told you to. Ultimately, what we want is a society in which people do the right thing, not because they have to, but because they want to, because it's in their hearts uh, to uh, find ways to cooperate and to assist each other for mutual benefit. That's what a free and responsible people of strong character do. So um, uh, I know this is, uh, speech is not very long, but you probably have an abundance of speeches to listen to. I just want to say uh, I appreciate this opportunity to offer just a few thoughts. Um, I will send uh, Mr. Jedlika another um, a video that, if time permits, he may choose to show you, but uh, that's entirely his call. But uh, from the bottom of my heart, and from Noonan, Georgia, where I'm making this recording at my home, I want to thank all of you involved with Liberland for the vision that you're offering the world. Don't give up. Keep at it. Someday you will look back on what you've done and be very proud that you stood four square for one of the most noble ideas that can animate the human mind, and that is the idea that men and women must be free. Thank you.